Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Hare Krishna Prabhu, please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Srila Prabhupada. Uh. Can we begin, Prabhu? Uh, yes, Maharaj, uh, because students will be joining in the meantime, so we can begin. Om Ajnana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militandena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhupaya Vacha Patita nam pavane bio, Vaishnavi bio, namo namaha. Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Gadadhar, Shri Vasati Gaur Bhaktavinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Rama Rama Hare Hare. So we're continuing our study of the Srimad Bhagavatam at the level of Bhakti Vaibhav. So we're on the sixth canto and today we're beginning chapter 14 entitled King Chitraketu's Lamentation. So, in the previous chapter, we heard about we heard about the death of Vritasura and how it was a very glorious death, how he was a great devotee, and he was killed by Indra, the king of the demigods. So we heard also about how Indra suffered from sinful reactions because of killing Vritasura. So in this chapter, it begins with a question asked by Parikshit Maharaj to Sukadeva Goswami. And Parikshit Maharaj wants to understand how it was that this... Uh, demon Vritasura, how he could be such a great devotee. Because usually those who are demons, they're just simply the mode of passion and ignorance. But this Vritasura was, a, was, a, was very much in the mode of goodness. Although he was a demon and he was fighting Indra, but the way he was speaking to Indra and the manner in which he fought with Indra showed that he was actually very much in the mode of goodness and he was very steady and determined and tolerated so much pain and inconvenience. So anyway, uh, Parikshit Maharaj questions Sukadeva Goswami about this. So we're going to look at this 14th chapter here today and we'll hear about the previous life of Vritasura. Vritasura, of course, the clues given by the title of the chapter that Vritasura in his previous life, he was Chitraketu, who was at, he was at, at one point he was the king of the Vig Vijadharas. All right, so this 14th chapter begins with Maharaj Pariksit's question. And he's, uh, well, I'll read, the, I'll read the text, text number one. I'm, I'm sharing the screen. Are you able to see it, Prabhu? Yeah? You following? Yes, Maharaj. So King Pariksit, yes, yeah. King Pariksit inquired from Sukadeva Goswami, all learned Brahmana, Demons are generally sinful, being obsessed with the modes of passion and ignorance. 
How then could Vitrasura have attained such exalted love for the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Narayan? And so, yet yeah, certainly the material world is predominantly passion and ignorance. And we see everywhere how people are influenced by passion and ignorance. We're talking about uh, an encounter, this encounter between Rita Sura and Indra, this was taking place, well, it could have been like Treta Yuga or Satya Yuga. It wasn't taking place on the earthly planet was taking place on higher planets. The demons would come up from the lower regions of the universe to attack the demigods. Anyway, uh, Prabhupada in his purport, he quotes a verse from the Bhagavad Gita which describes the qualification for taking up devotional service. To do devotional service in that mood of dridavrat with great determination. And that determination was shown by Vritasura. So, this verse in the Bhagavad Gita describes that in order to do that kind of devotional service, you should have acted piously in previous lives, and your sinful reactions should have been destroyed almost to nil. So certainly it was surprising that Rita Sura could be such a nice devotee when he was in such a demoniac body. So this is a very good question asked by Maharaj Pariksit. We'll go ahead, text number three and four. Mm. Oh, number two, demigods in the mode of goodness and great saints hardly ever render pure devotional service. Therefore, how could Vritasura have become such a great devotee? So Maharaj Parikshit is making this point that even people who are great saints and those personalities who are demigods, even how they are not even on the level of pure devotees. They still have some desire for material enjoyment. So how is it possible that Vritasura could have been such a great devotee? And then text number three. In the material world, there are as many living entities as atoms. Among these living entities, a very few are human beings, and among them, few are interested in, fo in following religious principles. <laughs> so, uh, this, this is Maharaj Pariksha's statement. He's describing, first of all, the rarity of human life, that we're, you're very, we're very fortunate to get that. Sometimes devotees also sing that song, the song by, is it, uh, Govinda Das, think Bajahari Mana, Prabhupada used to sing the song, Bajahari Mana, Sri Nanda Nandana, Abhaya Charanara Vindure, Dullabha manava jananma satsangi tarahoi bhavo sindhuri. The Dullabha manava is very rare to get the human form of life. And it's even more rare to get association with devotees. So Maharaj Parikshit will go on and describe that. He said, very few are human beings, there's so many living entities, an infinite number of living entities, as many living entities as there are atoms. So there's so many living entities, but only few are human beings. And then of those who are 
For those of us who have the human body, it's rare that people have an interest in following religious principles. Right? What's the verse in Bhagavad Gita which describes this? No, we just had that verse. There's another verse. Right. right, right, yes, right. After many births, and, uh, out of many living entities, uh, hardly one is endeavouring for perfection. And of those who have achieved perfection, hardly one knows me in truth. Bahunam Janmanamanti Gyanapam Mamprapajanti Vasadev Sarvamiti Samahatma Sudurlabaha. And Prabhupada would refer to sometimes devotees. Prabhupada would call devotees Mahatmas sometimes. So devotees, because they're, they've surrendered to Krishna. So devotees are very rare. So here also Parikshit Maharaj is saying, there's only very few people among human beings who are interested in following religious principles. But then text number four continues, he goes on and he says that of those who follow religious, those who, are, who, who try to follow religious principles, only a few desire liberation from the material world. So some people, they, they may be quite religious, they follow the principle, but they don't, they're not interested in liberation. They don't think about liberation. And then he continues, among many thousands who desire liberation, one may actually achieve liberation. So, so many people may think about liberation, they may try to get liberation, but it's very rare that they actually get liberation, which because they have to give up all material attachment to society, friendship, love, country, home, wife and children. And among many thousands of such liberated persons, one who can understand the true meaning of liberation is very rare. So, in this way Maharaj Pariksit is describing the different levels of human life. That the, among human beings only a few are interested in religious principles. And of those who are interested in religious principles, only a few are trying for liberation. And those who Achieve liberation are very few because it's very difficult for people to understand the true meaning of liberation. They have to give up all of their material attachments. So Prabhupada talks about, in the purport, he talks about uh, different stages in Varnashram but coming to the Vanaprastha stage, then he says one should go on to the Sanya stage, completely accepting the renounced order of life. So Vanaprastha, you're still staying with the family, but you can go on from that and go on to renounce completely the connection with the material world. Prabhupada, of course, did that himself. And then text number five is the verse which is often quoted, which we often find uh, in the scriptures or in purports or so on. It's a famous verse, right? Mukta nam hi siddhanam narayana parayana sadullabha prasantatma kotishvapi mahamuni. Very nice verse. I think this must be one of your memorization verses, isn't it? Hmm? Yes, Maharaj, we are not verified, but this is 
All right, so Narayana, uh, Mukta Nama Pisida Nam, Narayana Parayana. Some devotees are Narayanaya. They, 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 they recognize the importance of surrendering to Narayana. But only a few are Narayana Parayana. Only a few have actually understood the real position of Lord Narayana and surrendered themselves to him. So the verse reads, among many millions who are liberated and perfect in knowledge of liberation, one may be a devotee of Lord Narayan. So some, many millions may be liberated and perfect in knowledge, but they're not devotees yet. Such devotees are Sudurlabha Prashant Atma, they're peaceful and it extremely rare. Prasanta Atma. So this is a qualification of the devotees, very rare souls. Prabhupada would say to be a devotee, to be a, a Vaishnava is not a very easy thing, very rare. So it's mentioned here, Kotishvapi Mahamuni. <laughs> out of millions and millions to get somebody who is really a devotee. It's very, a very rare thing. So Prabhupada talks about the Vanaprastas, coming to the Vanaprasta order and then moving on from there. If one is unattached to the family and children, then one can go further and accept the renounced order of life. People may want to be liberated, but it doesn't mean that they're actually liberated. Only rarely is somebody liberated. And Prabhupada said, many people may take sannyas to become liberated, but it doesn't mean they're actually liberated. Of course, in, that's in, in the Mayavadi line, in the line of Shankaracharya, when they accept sannyas, then they're considered liberated. And you meet a Mayavadi sannyasi, you're supposed to say, Namo Narayan, that I offer my obeisances to you, who is one with Lord Narayan. So, uh, this is the position. Uh, even in ISKCON, we see people also accepting sannyas, but they're not always able to maintain it, and they, some, they have to go back again to the material platform. They're not able to maintain the spiritual practices which are required in the renounced order of life. So Prabhupada quotes in the purport, again famous verse from the tenth canto, uh, uh, from the prayers of the demigods, Yanyera Vindakshya Vamuktamani Nas Tvayasta Bhavad Avishuddha Buddhaya, because their intelligence is not purified, then they, one may fall back. Although they've come to the level of Brahman, they go back again. Arora Krishrena Param Patam Tada Patanti Addo Nadreta Yasmad Angraya. They fall back again into the material world and they take up again material activities. They have not fully embraced the activities of a liberated soul and they come back to the material platform again. All right, so this is a, an important verse here, and, and you can see it's quite a long purport here, Prabhupada talking about the difficulties and maintaining the liberated platform.
and the purport their property rights, whatever they desire for the future will be baffled. Even if they approach, even if they apparently engage in devotional service, they are described as mogasha, because they ultimately desire to merge into the Brahman effulgence. And then Prabhupada quotes Srimad Bhagavatam, second chapter, a verse which we often recite, Srimadam Svakita Krishna, Punya Shravana Kirtana. So spiritual activities is based on this principle of hearing and chanting. And it's by hearing and chanting that we can take away that desire for material enjoyment from the heart. We have to absorb ourselves in this business of hearing and chant, chanting the holy name and hearing about Krishna, Krishna's pastimes. So studying Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita, reading these books, very important. A, a little bit from the purport here I've marked, unless the dirt within the core of one's heart is cleansed away, one cannot become a pure devotee. Therefore, the word Sudurlabha, very rarely found, is used in this verse. Right? Sudurlabha prasanna atma kotishvapi mahamuni. Not only among hundreds and thousands, but among millions of perfectly liberated souls, a pure devotee is hardly ever found. <laughs> it's, a, it's so rare to get a pure to be a pure devotee. So there are then Prabhupada quotes in the purport here this verse, nice verse from Madhvacharya, giving the following quotation from the Tantra Bhagavata. He says. There are 90 million demigods and 70 million great sages. Wait. 70 million great sages who are all called Narayan Ayana, devotees of the Lord. Narayan. Among them, only a few are called Narayana Parayana. So, only a few are the pure devotees. The pure devotees there, Narayana Parayana, they've actually understood that Lord Narayan is the personality of Godhead. And the others, they are called Narayanayana. They're chanting the holy name, they have some faith, but they're, they're not freed of they're not completely convinced, they've still got some anartas. They're not yet on the level of pure devotees. And so, the, the end of the purport, this important verse here, the fifth verse in this fourteenth chapter, Prabhupada explains the difference between the Siddhas and the Narayana Parayanas. Right? Those who are Siddhas, they are interested in mystic power, mystic yoga, so they're called Siddhas. But those who are Narayana Parayana, they're the direct devotees, and they're just simply engaged in devotional service. So there's a big difference between the two. All right. So going ahead. Uh, Maharaj Pariksha is still speaking. Vitrasura was situated in the blazing fire of battle and was an infinite, infamous, sinful demon, always engaged in giving trouble and anxiety to others. How could such a demon become so greatly Krishna conscious? Oh, Krishna, sorry. What happened here? It has been described that a Narayana Parayana, a pure devotee, is rarely found even among millions and millions of persons. Therefore, Parikshit Maharaj was surprised 
that Vitrasura, whose purpose was to give trouble and anxiety to others, was one of these devotees, even on a battlefield. What was the reason for Vitrasura's advancement? <laughs> Maharaj Pariksha is so shocked. How could this demon advance so much? He's surprised. He wants to hear from Sukadeva Goswami about this. So it just appears contradictory to the to the philosophy that somebody who's so sinful and he's engaged in fighting the demigods, how could a demon, how could he be a great devotee of Lord Krishna? So these contradictions, Maharaj Parikesh said, text number seven, these contradictions have caused me great doubt and they have made me eager to hear of this from you. So this is Srimad Bhagavatam, you see, Maharaj Parikshit is hearing about these great devotees and he's putting very important, relevant questions to Sukadeva Goswami to elicit more understanding, to get the complete picture of what's happening there in this dealings between these different people. So, Sukadeva Goswami, text 9, goes on, he said, I have heard from the mouths of Vyasadeva, Narada and Devala. Please listen with attention. Certainly Sukadeva had heard from Vyasadeva, it's his father. And Narada is the spiritual master of Vyasa. So, Vyasadeva heard from Narada, Sukadeva must have also had the opportunity. And then Devala is also coming. We, we hear the name Devala in the Bhagavad Gita. Arjuna mentioned great sages like Asita, Devala, Vyasa, that they all accept Lord Krishna as being the Supreme. So Sukadeva Goswami continues. And he, he, he begins telling us, now we're going to hear about Chitra Ketu. And of course the title of the chapter is about Chitra Ketu, the, the lamentation of Chitra Ketu. So Chitra Ketu was a king in the province of Shurasena. And he, he was a very powerful king. He, could, he ruled the entire earth. And then we're told also, during his reign, the earth produced all the necessities for life. So Prabhupada, in this important section, discusses the importance of having a good ruler. And how when there's a good ruler, then it, it has a nice effect that... Uh, the world is provided with all necessities. All the people on the planet are properly provided for. They receive all of the natural resources which they need for their maintenance. So the good ruler is crucial for the welfare of the planet. We know 5,000 years ago before the appearance of Lord Krishna, Mother Earth had to go to Lord Brahma to appeal for help because the planet Earth was overburdened by too many demoniac Kshatriyas. And we have also, from Srimad Bhagavatam, we have instances about other kings. Maybe you can think of some other kings who produced bad effects in the planet. Maharaj Vena. Maharaj Vena. Can you tell us more about Vena? Yes, he comes in the disciplinary succession of uh, Dhruva Maharaj. Yes. And, uh, he was not uh, honoring the Lord. And uh, he said others to uh, honor him. <laughs> the king is uh, the shelter of all 
the, the, the gods and etc. So all the suggest to uh, pray me, the king. In this way, the, he was telling. He was not. He was opposing the worship of the Lord, Supreme Lord. Yes. And uh, finally, if the Brahmanas caused him and uh, put him to death. Mm-hmm. And uh, thereafter, the the, the Brahmanas um, by by uh, Manthan, that is called uh, that uh, by that uh, friction of his body, uh, Prithu Maharaj came, who is also a, an incarnation of the Lord. Yes. And he in the age of uh, in the Bena, the earth was not producing any food. And that's why uh, Prithu Maharaj made that go uh, uh, Dohana. He made uh, this. Uh, um, at, uh, so that uh, earth produced uh, some sufficient foods. Yes, very good. Thank you very much. Yes, we're told about Vena. Here comes cruel Vena. He was so such a cruel person. Even as a young child, he would play with his friends and he would kill his friends. He would kill them. So. <laughs> The, fa- the father, the father of Vena actually, he wanted so much to have a son. When he finally got a son, and he saw the son was so demoniac, then he understood that this was the arrangement of the Lord. It, the Lord wanted him to detach himself from the material world. And the father went off into the forest to do austerities. <laughs> so it's a nice example that he, he wanted so much to have a son, when he got the son, it was such a problem, it was such a headache for him. And it was so, he felt so ashamed and disgusted that his son was so cruel and had so many bad qualities that he just gave up everything and he renounced himself from the world. And so he appreciated that the, the, the bad son helped him to become detached from the material world. When you have a good son, then you feel very proud, you want to be with the son and so on, and joy with the son. But when the son is bad, when the son is not, <laughs> you want to... Of course, sometimes it's very difficult for people to see the wrong in their son. Uh, some years ago, quite a few years ago now, there was a case in the USA there was a murderer and he had murdered like 30 or more people. You know, he was a mass murderer. So they finally caught him. And when they, when they had arrested him, they had interviewed the mother of the man. And they asked the, the mother, you know, what do you think about your son? You know, he's a murderer, he's killed so many people. And the mother said, oh, you know, my son, He's such a nice boy. You don't know. He's such a nice boy. <laughs> so even though the man was a murderer, very cruel, hard-hearted, but still the mother couldn't see any fault in her son. And so this is material attachment. Sometimes people are so attached they cannot see in, in the wrong in people. All right, so. Anyway, it, it's very important that the, there should be a good ruler. And, and I've, I've marked there in the purple a little bit here, mentions there, when there is a good ruler, that source produces the necessities of life abundantly. However, when there is not such a good ruler, there will be scarcity. And what are some good examples, good rulers? Who were the good rulers who provided so nicely for everyone? Prithu Maharaj. Who? Prithu Maharaj. Yeah, we heard about Prithu Maharaj. Some more. Who else? Uh, Rishab. Who? Rishab, Rishab. Rishab Dev. Okay, yes. Parikshit Maharaj. Parikshit Maharaj, yes. Parikshit Maharaj. He would restrict Kali, right? When he was ruling, Kali could not come in his kingdom. Yes. 
some more? Lord Ramachandra. Lord Ramachandra. Lord Ram. Yes. Lord Ramachandra, he was that Ram Raja, the government of Lord Ram is appreciated and glorified even today. To have a ruler like Lord Ramachandra was so wonderful, so beneficial. Everyone was happy. If it, it, it said Lord Ramachandra, when he was ruling, if there was anybody who had any complaint, they could come to him and he would hear what, what was wrong. He wanted to know what is happening. And nobody would come. Everyone was so happy. Everyone was so satisfied that everything is being provided by the grace of God. And so certainly when Lord Ramachandra was a king, there was no scarcity for people. And similarly, when Lord Krishna was, the, was on the planet, there was no scarcity. Everything was provided. You know, some time back, not very long ago, it just like a, you know, 10 years ago or so ago, there was this one man who people were thinking he's an incarnation of God. And he lived in Bangalore, near Bangalore there. And people were wondering, that they're thinking, is he, is he the avatar, is he the Kali Yuga avatar, is he God? But it was pointed out that actually if he was God, why is the planet so poor? Why is there so much poverty on the earth? If he is actually God, there will be no scarcity, there will be no poverty anywhere. So this was the argument which was given by one of our senior devotees in ISKCON when he was asked, is this man really an incarnation of God? He told me, he couldn't be, the earth is too poor. When the Lord comes, there's no scarcity. Just like when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came on the planet also, the planet was in a very prosperous condition. All right, so Prabhupada talks about the, the importance of having the good ruler because when you have the pious ruler, then the people will also be encouraged by the nice example of the ruler and they will, they will also act in the proper manner. At the end of the purport there, of text number 10, Prabhupada writes, simply ruling the land cannot solve man's problems unless the leader has spiritual capabilities. He must be like Maharaj Yudhisthira, Parikshit Maharaj or Ramachandra. Then all the inhabitants of the land will be extremely happy. So do you agree with that? Any comments about that? Do you feel this is actually an overestimation of the power of devotees? No, Maharaj. Okay. During the times of Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati and Srila Prabhupada, did it mean everybody was happy? They were great devotees. What can you say? Those who have um, followed in Prabhupada Maharaj, they were all happy. Others, those who have not followed, they are in, uh, in danger. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah, if they followed Prabhupada, they were happy. You take shelter of Prabhupada, Prabhupada's teachings, you're happy. Everything is provided. Mm -hmm. We need to take shelter of the pure devotee's instructions and then we can be happy. It's actually people don't know what is real happiness today. Their idea of happiness is simply sense gratification, simply satisfying their senses. If they can fill their belly, they're thinking they're happy. They think, oh, I'm happy, I, I could fill my belly with some food. 
They have no idea what is real happiness. They have no experience of the spiritual platform. So, <laughs> sometimes it's difficult to educate people about these things. They have no real spiritual awakening. They have no experience of what is real happiness, the happiness from the soul. But in the times of these great personalities, Maharaj Yudhisthira, Parikshit Maharaj, Lord Ramachandra, we know when Lord Ramachandra was ruling the earth, when he finished his rule, he gave up ruling the kingdom, went back to Godhead, all the people all followed him. All the Ayodhyavasis, all the Dambasis, they all followed, they all entered into the Sarayu, and they all entered into the river Sarayu and they all went back to Godhead. Okay, we'll go ahead. Text number 11. So Chitra Ketu had 10 million wives. But although he was capable of producing children, he did not receive a child from any of them. By chance, all the wives were barren. <laughs> Could you imagine? Million, ten million wives. <laughs> it's inconceivable. Ten million wives. How many wives did Lord Krishna have? Lord Krishna had only 16,108 wives. And Lord Ramachandra only had one wife. Maharaj Datharas, he had more, he had like 360 wives. And of course, Vasudev, Krishna's father, how many wives did he have? 17. Huh? 17, Maharaj. 17 wives, okay. So 17 wives. So he had Chitra Ketu, 10 million wives. Now, Prabhupada said, if the, if, if the woman is healthy and the man is potent, then there will be conception. <laughs> wow, one, one devotee said that to me. There was this one devotee, one of my god brothers. He had quite a large family and I, I was a little surprised that he had so many children. He said to me, he said, no, if the man is potent and the woman is healthy, then there will be conception. So here you have Maharaj Chitra Ketu, it's described, he was all right, he was healthy, he was capable of having children, but somehow none of the women were able to produce a, a child for him. Ten million. <laughs> So, Chitraketu is described, the opulence of Chitraketu is then described. Now, in material world, people are interested in opulence. Queen Kunti talks about opulence and Prabhupada quotes it in the verse, he, in the purport rather, he talk, quotes the words of Queen Kunti, Janma Aishwash Shruta Shribir. Edamana Madapuman. So Maharaj Chitra Ketu had all of these things. He had Janma, he's born in the noble family, aristocratic family, and Aishwarya, he's opulent. He's got a lot of money, he's got the, he's ruling the whole earth. And Shruta, he's well educated, and he's also Sri. He's very good looking, he's handsome, he's attractive, but still a problem. There's still a problem that's very difficult for people to be satisfied in the material world. And the, what is Maharaj Chitraketu's problem? He did not have a son. Oh. <laughs> I mean, sometimes we, well, quite often actually, we come across people. First of all, 
you get people, they want a wife. That's the first thing. They want a wife. They want to get married. And so finally, they get a wife. And once they get a wife, then next thing is, wife wants a child. So they want a child. But they want to have a son. If they don't have a son, they're not satisfied. Oh, and they'll come for blessings. Bless us. We should have a son. And so especially someone who is in the royal order, the king, he wants to have a son. Because if he just has daughters, the daughters cannot become the king. <laughs> well, the, the queen. <laughs> of course, we do have the situation. We have queens. You get queens just like we had the queen of England. There was the queen ruling. She passed away now, but she was ruling for many years, the Queen of England. But usually the, the royal throne would be for the, the male, for the son. So the father wants to have the son who will perform the, the shrad. He will do the ceremony, offer the oblations for, on behalf of the forefathers and deliver the forefathers from hell. So very important, right? The son is called Putra, and Prabhupada said Putra means one who saves the father from going to hell. So here also Maharaj Chitraketu is in this desperate situation that he must have a son. It is a big problem for him. And of course it's a big business today in countries like India also, not only India, other countries also. You have test tube babies and you have uh, other methods also. You have surrogate wives and <laughs> some other woman will come along. They had this one couple in one country where I preach in. The couple wanted to have a child and somehow the wife could not conceive. So then the husband arranged a surrogate wife. Another woman came and he impregnated this other woman and she got pregnant and gave birth to the child. And then she gave the child to his original wife and they paid her quite a bit of money to do this. The woman came and she got pregnant and she gave birth to the child and then she gave the child to the couple. She went, she was happy, she got a sum of money which satisfied her and she went off with the money. She didn't, she gave birth to the child and gave up the child to the couple. So that kind of thing is going on today. And then you have also, you have the the semen bank, they will take the sperm from so many different people, they will keep it and then they will impregnate it into the womb of the woman. So it's not, the, it's not really the husband who is impregnating the wife, it's some other man's semen which is being put into the womb of a, a woman. But somehow they have a, the medical science is such that the woman will become pregnant and she'll conceive a child and she'll deliver a child. And so different artificial techniques are there so that people can get children. They have <clears throat> some technologies somehow to overcome nature. Difficult for people just to accept nature, to follow nature's plan. And they want to control nature. Just like the same thing is there with the weather. When we want rain, they have like, they will fly some, help, some planes into the air and release chemicals which will cause rain. And so we're always trying to go against nature. We're trying to control nature ourselves. But Bhagavad Gita says, Lord Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Maya Dyakshena Prakriti 
Suryate Satcharan. This material nature is under my control, O son of Kunti. We're trying to be the controller. So this is the problem. And it's happening on all levels. And <laughs> there's so many things people want to change. They, you know, they, they're, they're not really meant to have a child, but somehow they arrange to give birth to a child. And people, some places in Japan, they don't like the color of their eyes. They want to change the color of their eyes. And they don't like the color of their hair. They will bleach their hair, dye the color of their hair. And then they'll do things for the color of their skin. Oh, my skin is too dark, my skin should be light. Or my skin is too light, my, my skin should be darker. We're always trying to change nature's laws. We are trying to control the nature. But of course we fail miserably in our attempts to control nature. We always end up the loser. However, certainly uh, in family life, grihastha life, there's a duty. And Prabhupada describes here, grihastha life does not mean having a wife and no children. Some people, of course, do like that. They want a wife, but they don't want children. And they will do things to avoid having children, of course. There's so many techniques. What just, there's abortions which go on regularly. That's, of course, very sinful. And then they have also uh, birth control devices so that the woman will not get pregnant. And they, will have thing, they have things like contraceptives so that the man will not impregnate his semen into the womb of the woman. All these different techniques to try to stop having children. They want to avoid having children, but at the same time, they still want the wife and they still want sex. So that is very sinful. And, and this is how women are exploited in this way. Women, some women, they don't want to have children, but they want sex. This is very sinful. And you get sinful reactions for that. Sinful reactions come in the form of health problems. People's health will deteriorate very quickly. So Prabhupada quotes many places Chanakya Pandit in this section. He said, if a family man has no son, his home is no better than a desert. Would anybody like to comment on that? If a, fa if a family man has no son, his home is no better than a desert. Right? Who, who, have we got some Grihasta here? Who could comment on this? Uh, yes, Maras. Yes. Because this son uh, is the central point of attraction of the family. Uh, so far as love and affection is concerned, everyone revolves around the son as a, as a central point of love and affection. They just end up upon him adequate love of the family. Whenever the child uh, talks, they become very, very amazed, very, uh, very delighted. Yes, child is talking. They play with the child. Uh, Father, mother, they every time focus upon the child's uh, nourishment, his growth, etc. So, child makes the family very, uh, very pleasurable, very joyful in the absence of the family. The family becomes dried, withered. Do you have a dog. child yourself? Did you? <laughs> yes, mother. I have been endowed with two children. You have two children? Yes. You have a son? Yes, I have a son and uh, one daughter. One son, one daughter, eh? Not two. So you have experienced yourself, yeah? Yes, Maharaj. Yeah, thank you very much, Prabhu. <laughs> and 
was it a great difficulty to get children in your family life? Or were you able to conceive, your wife was able to conceive children without too much trouble? Yeah, in natural process, children uh, were, children uh, were begotten in natural process, there was no difficulty. No difficulty, yeah. But today, you see what happens today, a lot of people, they will wait till they're older. You see, what age were you when you had children? What was your age? It matters my age is now 52 years. No, but when the children were first born. Children say it matters? No, your age. What was your age? My age is 52 years. 52. When you had children? Children, whenever I was uh, 32. Right, you were a young man then. See, that's the point. You see, today, you got people waiting till their 40s, they want to have a child. You know, so it's too late. It's, you know, <laughs> they, they want to, they say, we want to enjoy while we're young, and then later on we'll have a child. So they want to enjoy a lot of sexual pleasures when they're young, without having a child. Then later on, as they get older, they think we should have a child. And then, of course, it's too late. And so this is the problem. This is why they have all these fertility clinics. It's mostly older people who are coming there who have the problems. Young people don't have much difficulty to have children. But young people don't want the children. They don't want the responsibility until they get a bit older. When they start to get a bit older, they think about it. Oh, it would be nice to have a child. And <laughs> it's already too late. Mm. So this, this is the problem. The, we have this idea, we want to enjoy, we want sense gratification. But the sense gratification is there, have a child. It's not, it, it's not a lot, so much trouble, it's natural. But to kill a child, to kill or to stop pregnancy, to prevent pregnancy, that is sinful. And you go against nature's laws, you suffer, you get reactions for that. So here's Maharaj Chitraketu, he wanted so much to have a child, but he wasn't able to do it. So he had so many wives, 10 million wives, they're all beautiful, attractive eyes and opulences, hundreds and thousands of queens. But there was no happiness. There was nothing able to give him the happiness he wanted because he wanted a son. All right, going ahead, text 19. Once upon a time, a great sage named Angira was traveling all over the universe without engagement. By his sweet will, he came to the palace of King Chitraketu. So, in the past, there were these kings, there were, they had palaces, and there were great sages traveling also, and the sages would come to meet the kings. So Chitraketu was very respectful to Angira, and he got up from his throne and he worshipped him. So we see in Bhagavatam about reception. The, import, the etiquette in receiving guests, and especially here's the guest coming, Angira. Now, he, was he invited there to come there? No, With, no, no. He, he, he incidentally is there. There is no invitation. Yeah, no invitation. The uninvited guest. Some people, sometimes, now today, if you go to people who say, 
Why you have come here? Who told you to come here? <laughs> you know, some people are like that. But actually the Vedic culture is such that if the sadhu, the saintly person will come, we should be happy. We should be very happy to receive him. And of course here, Maharaj Shitraketu, he's, he's very happy to see this person coming to his palace. And he, he worships him, just like Krishna received Sudama Brahman. Of course, Sudama was his old friend. And in Ramayan, you have Vishwamitra coming to visit Maharaj Dasara. Maharaj Dasara glorified Vishwamitra. O oh, great sage who is engaged in conquering death. So these kings, these kings, they understood the importance of these saintly persons. And they honored them. They knew how powerful they were and how they could get blessings from them. So Maharaj Chitraketu is very happy to receive him. He's controlling his mind and senses, and he's also humbling himself in the presence of the great sage. He sat on the ground at the side of the rishi's feet. He did not sit on the same level. He gave the rishi a big seat, and he sat on the floor at his side. Just like Uddhava, Uddhava was a friend of Krishna, but he would never sit on the same level as Lord Krishna. And Prabhupada describes, he said, when he was a new devotee, he said he wasn't so familiar with this etiquette. And at one time it happened that he sat on the same seat where his Guru Maharaj was sitting. And his Guru Maharaj, Srila Om Vishnupad Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada, he, he, he allowed him, he didn't, he didn't chastise him, he didn't tell him, get down, but he allowed him to sit there. Of course, the, the god-brothers, the devotees, they all told him that, you know, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't sit on the same level as your Guru Maharaj. And Prabhupada said, well, I, I wasn't familiar at the time, initially, because he was just start, starting to associate with the devotees. So he, he hadn't been, he wasn't so much familiar with the culture. But that was only one time he did that and he didn't do that again. So Chitraketu is very humble, low in humility, sitting at the feet of the sage. And the sage is very pleased with the reception and he congratulates Maharaj Chitraketu. Maybe we'll take a break here, we have to have a break. Let's have a ten minute break. Okay. Hare Krishna. All right, so uh, Angira had come to the home, come to the palace, Chitraketu, and he'd been given a nice welcome. And the king was very humble. So Angira is inquiring from the king. And Angira is asking the king, he said, as text number 17, Angira is beginning to speak to the king. I hope that your body and mind and your royal associates and paraphernalia are well. When the seven properties of material nature, the total material energy, the ego and the five objects of sense gratification are in proper order, the living entity within the material elements is happy. 
Without these seven elements, one cannot exist. Similarly, a king is always protected by seven elements. His instructor, meaning Swami or Guru, his ministers, his kingdom, his fort, his treasury, his royal order, and his friends. So, this is describing, Angira is telling to the king, I hope you're happy, and mentions about the seven elements which protect the king. Just like the spiritual teacher, his instructor, will guide and protect us. The spiritual teacher will tell us what we should do, what we shouldn't do. He will give us some advice, of course, for our spiritual benefit generally. It's not really the duty of the guru to direct uh, his disciples in their material affairs, but for their spiritual welfare, he will direct them. And then his ministers, the ministers will be giving some indications, telling the king what he needs to do, the kingdom itself, and then his fort, his fort, he would have to have a fort where he would keep his army would be based, they would certainly be there to protect him. His treasury, he needs to have some money, he has to have some funds there to maintain the kingdom and to keep maintain the palace, he would have to have a lot of treasure. So that would also protect him. His royal order, just the fact that he was king, would command so much respect and people would honour him and want to protect him. And his friends as well. So, in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna also mentions about the position of the king. In the 10th chapter, Bhagavad Gita, right? Krishna says in Vibhuti Yoga, he said, Among men, I am the monarch. So the king is a representative of God on earth. This is Lord Krishna's statement there in Bhagavad Gita. So a king is an important person. And the king, he should be protected by these different seven items which are all listed there. When these seven are in proper order, the living entity is in a mood of pleasure. Generally, when the associates of the king are quiet and obedient, the king can be happy. Therefore, the great sage Angira Rishi inquired about the king's personal health and the good fortune of his seven associates. When we inquire from a friend whether everything is well, we are concerned not only with his particular self, self, but also with his family, his source of his source of income, and his assistants or servants, all of them must be well, and then a person can be happy. So that makes a lot of sense. You know, we often meet people, they'll say, Oh, I'm so worried my business is failing. Oh, I'm so worried my wife is in poor health or one of the children is sick or something. You know, these are all different problems for people. And so an individual uh, uh, is he's, he's not only his own self, but then there's the extended self. And the extended self comes in the form of the family members, the children, and the business, and the home, 
All of these things are important. So Maharaj Angira wants to know, is everything okay? Because Maharaj Angira can understand something is not right. He could see the king didn't look very happy. And then the purport of text 18, Prabhupada writes, the actual happiness of a king and his dependence is described in this verse. A king should not simply give orders to his dependents because he is supreme. Sometimes he must follow their instructions. Similarly, the dependents should depend on the king. This mutual dependence will make everyone happy. Can you understand this? Prabhupada is talking about how even though you may be king, you may be the, the authority, but don't think you know everything. We, even though we may be in that position, it doesn't mean we're the absolute controller. And we have to be willing to hear from others. And just like Prabhupada would do that, Prabhupada would ask the devotees. Even though the devotees were so young and Prabhupada was so much senior to them, you know, Prabhupada was in his 70s and 80 and the devotees were just in their 20s and 30s. But Prabhupada would ask to them, what do you think? What should we do? He would ask them, a Sridhar Swami, our Sridhar Swami was telling me, and Prabhupada asked him, what do you think Sridhar Swami, what should we do? <laughs> And Sridhar said, Oh, Prabhupada, I don't know. <laughs> Sridhar said, he said, I had no idea what to do. But Prabhupada was asking. So Prabhupada would be willing to hear from other people. He didn't think, you know, I'm, I'm the guru, I know everything. Nobody tells me what. He'd be willing to hear. So this is an important point, even you're the king. It's not that he simply gives orders to people. Sometimes you also have to take orders. And you see that in Ramayana, you see Maharaj Dhatarath, Vishwamitra came there and he wanted to take Ram away with him to kill some demons. Oh, Maharaj Dhatarath was, oh no, no, you can't take my son. Vishwamitra got angry. <laughs> but Maharaj Dasarath surrendered and he, he gave Ram to go with Vishwamitra. Can you think of any other examples? Someone's in a, a, a position of authority and they take instruction from others? Uh, in the case of Nityanandra also, his father, Hadai Pandit, and one uh, Rishi came, one uh, saint came and uh, took his uh, son in Tirtha. Okay, yes. Nanda Maharaj, when uh, Krishna requested, he changed uh, Indra Puja into Govardhan. Maharaj. Oh, Krishna is telling Nanda Maharaj. Hmm? Yes, Maharaj. Indra Puja, they stopped Indra Puja and they did Govardhan Puja. Yes, don't worship Indra, worship the Govardhan hill and the cows. Of course, Lord Krishna is the Supreme Lord. <laughs> he can tell everyone what to do. Can you think of any examples where somebody tells Krishna what to do? Well, when they wanted to put uh, Yudhisthira on the throne to perform the Ashwamedha Yajna or the Rajasuri Yajna, they met, the, he, Lord Krishna met with 
other people. We met with Uddhava, the Pandavas. What should we do? And then they decided we have to kill Jarasandha. The Jarasandha is the obstacle. We cannot perform Rajasuya Yagna so long as Jarasandha is there. Sometimes Lord Krishna would ask Uddhava, what should we do? What can, what can, what can be done? Because Uddhava was highly intelligent, he was a disciple of Brihaspati, so he knew what to do in different situations. So he was like secretary to Krishna, and he would sometimes request Krishna certain things to be done. Just like Prabhupada would have secretary the secretary would tell Prabhupada some things. All right, any other points you can think? Giving instruction to others? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, after Sanyas, uh, requested his mother to, uh, when she was not allowing him, she, uh, he asked her to uh, give her instruction. Wherever she wants to say, stay, he was willing to stay. What the mother is giving, she's giving instruction to Lord Chaitanya. Yes, Maharaj. That she requested him to stay at uh, Jagannath Puri and uh, uh, he was he was staying in Jagannathpuri after that. Uh -huh. Okay. Then Sachimata wanted the Lord not to go all the way to Vrindavan. Mm -hmm. And, and Maharaj, Lord Chaitanya was hearing um, the signs of uh, devotional service from Rai Ramanand. He was explaining him beautifully. Yes, Ramananda Rai. Ramananda Rai was feeling that, you know, I'm just a grihasta, I'm in the sutra family, you're a sannyasi, you're a brahman, I should be asking you questions, but you're asking me. But Lord Chaitanya said, well, anyone who knows the signs of Krishna can become guru. So Lord Chaitanya was appreciating Ramananda Rai. He was appreciating his spiritual knowledge, his spiritual realization. Okay, let's go ahead. So Angira is speaking here to the king. Text 19, O king, are your wives citizens, secretaries and servants, and the merchants who sell spices and oil un under your control. Are you also in full control of ministers, the inhabitants of your palace, your provincial governors, your sons, and your other dependents? <laughs> yeah, so many people depending on you, you know, you just need one of them to go off and it can make a lot of trouble. And so, Angir is asking about them all. Hmm. Prabhupada said, the master or king and his subordinates should be interdependent. Through cooperation, both of them can be happy. So, Srila Prabhupada, before he departed from this world, what did he tell the devotees about cooperation? Tolerate and cooperate. Huh? Tolerate and cooperate. Yeah. He, formu he formulated, he uh, formulated the governing body commission, uh, which will cater to the cooperation of all different devotees 
They will follow the rules and regulations of Srila Prabhupada, the principles of devotional service, etc. So that is the uh, vision of Srila Prabhupada. Okay. Yes. But final, in the final days, Prabhupada also said, your love for me will be shown by how you cooperate with each other to keep this movement together after I am gone. So it's a famous quotation from Srila Prabhupada and you should be familiar with it, right? Cooperation Prabhupada said, your love for me will be shown by how you all cooperate with each other to keep this movement together. So here also, all the, so many people depending on the king, if something is wrong then it can affect everyone. So Angira continues speaking about the importance of having everybody working together and helping each other. Angira Angira Rishi asked the king whether his mind was also under control. This is most essential for happiness. We control the mind. How do we control the mind? How do you control your mind, Prabhu? Yes. Uh, there's a virgin nectar of devotion, or she can, or she can say, well, no, but the that we are engaging a sense in the service of the Lord with the controller of all senses, our mind can be controlled, and upon this principle, we are uh, relentlessly, we are practicing devotional service, and in this process, mind is becoming controlled. Yeah, you have to engage in devotional service, and especially we have to chant the holy name. And take shelter of the holy name will bring the mind under control, the agitated mind. It's a medicine for the mind, the chanting of the holy name. So Angira tells Maharaj Chitraketu, he said, I can see your mind is not pleased. You seem not to have achieved your desired goal. Is this because of you yourself or has it been caused by others? Your pale face reflects your deep anxiety, right? The face is the index of the mind. You just look at someone, you can understand who is happy and who is in an angry mood and who is tired. <laughs> you can see from the face, right? You can understand what a person's condition is from the face. So. Chitra, Angira could understand Chitra Ketu's condition was not very good, pale, looking, uh, depressed. Yeah. Uh -uh. Thanks. So Sukadeva Goswami continues. Angira knew everything. Angira is a great say he knew, but he's asking. He's just asking, he wants to confirm it uh, with the, you know, if you just say, I know you're not, you know, I can see you, then it's not very pleasing to people. But if you ask them and let them talk about it themselves, then it's better. It's better to let the individual bring it out himself rather than you tell them, I can see you like, <laughs> they won't be very happy. But if they themselves admit, oh yeah, I have this problem, then it's much better that they reveal everything themselves. So, Maharaj Chitra Ketu revealed his desire for a son. Hmm. He's going to tell Angira. And so it's very nice, text 23, uh, Chitraketu says, Because of austerity, knowledge and transcendental samadhi, 
you are freed from all the reactions of sinful life. Therefore, as a perfect yogi, you can understand everything, external and internal, regarding embodied conditioned souls like me. Yes, certainly. The, the, kids, the great souls, they can see immediately what is the condition. They are aware of everything. And you are asking me why I am full of anxiety. Therefore, in response to your order, let me disclose the cause. All right. So Maharaj Chitra Ketu is going to tell the cause of his anxiety, which Angira already knows. And so he says, text number 25, he said, I am not pleased with my empire, opulence or possessions, which are desirable even for great demigods, because I have no son. So this is the condition, unfortunate condition, the poor soul. He had everything money could buy. He had all the opulence and the power and the fame, but he had no son. And so he begs Angira, please save me and my forefathers. We are descending to the darkness of hell because I have no progeny. So please allow me to have a son. Hmm? And Prabhupada explains the importance of the son in the Vedic civilization. One gets married simply to have a son. The purpose of married life, to have a son who is needed to offer oblations to his forefathers. <laughs> so, of course, this is material. This is not spiritual, this is material, but it's an important point. So he's requesting Angira to help. So Angira has himself is a great personality, it's described here, he was born of Lord Brahma's mind. Angira is one of the sons of Brahma, born from the mind of Lord Brahma. Who else was born from the mind of Lord Brahma? Maradana. Huh? Maradamuni. Naradamuni, yes. Anybody else? Chaturkumaras. Chaturkumaras. Adamamuni, Daksha. Daksha. Kashyap. Kashyap. Okay. So Angira was born and he was, he was feeling merciful. So he performed a sacrifice and he arranged for Angira to get a son. He did a yagya and from the yagya they got the sweet rice, the remnants of the food offered in the yagya and it was given. It was given to this, the best of Chitraketu's queens, whose name was Krit, Krita Juti. So she was the first wife of Chitraketu, and it said she was the best wife. She was the best of all of his wives. So they gave her the sweet rice, and by taking the sweet rice posada, she conceived the child. And Angira tells him, you will have a son, will be the cause. But <laughs> this is the, the, the key thing, text 29, O oh, great king, now you will have a son who will be the cause of both jubilation and lamentation. So the sage then left, 
without waiting for Chitra Ketu's response. You will be a son, right? You will have a son who will be the cause of jubilation, harsha, and shoka, lamentation. So the son's name, Harsha Shok, one who will bring happiness and also distress. And Prabhupada explains this in the purport, because of his gross jubilation, his great jubilation, he could not actually understand the statement of the sage Angira. He accepted it to mean that there would certainly be jubilation because of the birth of the future son, but that he would be the king's only son. And being very opulent or very proud of his great wealth and empire, he would not be very obedient to the father. Thus the king was satisfied, thinking, Oh, let there be a son, it doesn't matter if he is not very obedient. <laughs> All right, it's a common scenario. The father is very rich, and so because the father is very rich and opulent, the son is very proud and lazy and not very good qualities, not very obedient, not very humble. That's why we give we glorify Lord Rama so much that he was so humble and obedient to his parents, although the father was so rich. But Maharaj Chitraketu, he thought that when Angira said, this son will bring you lamentation also, he thought it would be like that. He thought, oh, he will, he will just be disobedient to me. And then Prabhupada quotes at the end of the purport, Chanakya Pandit, What is the use of a son who is neither a learned scholar nor a devotee? Such a son is like a blind, diseased, blind diseased eye which always causes suffering. Nevertheless, the material world is so polluted that one wants to have a son, even though he is useless. This attitude was represented in the history of King Chitra Ketu. <laughs> he wants to have a son, even though the son is useless. All right, so, so Krita, Krita Juti conceives the child, she ate the remnants from the sacrifice and she conceives the child. After receiving semen, the child develops in the womb and then she gives birth. A son was born to the king. Hearing news, all the inhabitants were very pleased. All the people in the kingdom, in Surasena, were very pleased. And King Chitraketu is overjoyed. After purifying himself by bathing and decorating himself with ornaments, he engaged brahmanas in offering benedictions to the child and performing the birth ceremony. And then he, he gives great charity. The Brahmins, the king gave charity of gold, silver, garments, ornaments, villages, horses and elephants, as well as 60 crores of cows. 60 crores means 600 million cows. <laughs> he gave all that in charity. It's inconceivable. So he was so joyful that he, he wanted to give so much charity. Why was he giving so much charity? For the benefit of his son. Bless my child that he will have a long life. You see, he did so many things 
for the welfare of his son, that his son would have a long life, still the son died. So Prabhupada, get, oh, uh, rather Sukadeva Goswami is telling the story, he gives an example. He said, when a poor man gets some money after great difficulty, his affection for the money increases daily. Right? If you never had any money, maybe you're poor. And then you get, you get some money, oh, you feel so good, you feel so proud, so happy to get the money. So Maharaj Chitraketu, after great difficulty, got a son. So the affection for the son increased day after day. As if having the child, there was so much pleasure for him. And the mother also was in, they were so much in love with their child. But there was a problem. In every endeavor, there's always some fault. So what was the problem? What's the problem? The king uh, loved his uh, uh, wife, that, that wife who gave birth to his son. Uh, another wives become envious. Uh, yeah. Okay, why? Yeah. Why were they envious? Because uh, king uh, loved much the wife who begot the child, so they became envious. Yeah. Much attention. Yeah. The king didn't care about the other wives anymore because they didn't give birth to any child. Child. Only this one woman, Krita Jyoti, she'd given birth to a child and the other women never gave birth, so he didn't worry about them, he neglected them. Now that was his fault, that was Chitraketu's mistake, that he did not take care of the other wives, he should have been thinking about them also and caring for them, but he neglected them and they felt very unfortunate. Uh, described here, text thir uh, 38, King Chitraketu, uh, his affection for Queen Krita duty increased, but gradually he lost affection for the other wives who had no son. He did not show any feeling and any care for them, although they were all his wives. So they were very unhappy because they have no son and the king is neglecting them. So they feel, they feel very unfortunate. So mentioned here, in text 40, he said, these other wives, they became, they were supposed to be co-wives, but they became just like maidservants. And it says they're condemned in every respect because of her sinful life. No child means some sin is there, some bad karma. They wanted a child, but they were not able to get it. It's like bad, bad react, some sinful reactions. And then 41 said, one's position is that, w the, like the, the, the co-wives are describing their position, they said, our position is that we are maidservants of the maidservant. Therefore, we are most unfortunate. They said, we're not just maidservants, we're maidservants of the maidservant. <laughs> servant of the servant. So it's, it's, not, it's a real come down after being the co-wife, one of the co-wives of the king, you become the servant of the maidservant. So like that they were very discouraged.
and their envy became very strong because they were neglected, they were not given the care which they needed. It's an important thing. You accept a wife, you have to take care of her. You have to care for their feelings. But so as their envy increased, they lost their intelligence. Being extremely hard-hearted and unable to tolerate the king's neglect, they finally administered poison to the son. Mm. Of course, Queen Kritaduti, she didn't know that these other wives had given poison to the son. She didn't know. She thought the boy was asleep. And she thought, oh, let him sleep, let him sleep. But he'd been sleeping for a long time. So finally she told the nurse, bring my son, wake him up, bring him. He's sleeping so long. And the maidservant went there and she saw the child was dead. And she just fainted. She fell to the ground. It was such a shock because everyone was so attached to the child. He was the, the heir to the throne, the son of the king. And they all loved him so much. So the maidservant just fell to the ground in shock, seeing the child was dead. And then the queen came and she saw the child was dead and she also fainted and like she became like dead. She was totally, totally disturbed and she didn't know what to do. And everyone began to cry in the palace. Everywhere people are screaming and crying. And the king wondered what's going on and then the king comes and he finds out the son is dead and he also starts to cry and he's almost blinded because he had so much affection for his son. So like this, so we're told some of the, the thinking of the queen seeing her dead son, that she saw her husband lamenting and she saw a dead child. So she lamented and she, her lamentation is very interesting. And text 54 describes how she says, uh, O oh, Providence, O oh, Creator, you are certainly inexperienced in creation. For during the lifetime of a father, you have caused the death of his son. Thus, acting in opposition to your creative laws. If you are determined to contradict these laws, you are certainly the enemy of loving, of living entities and are never merciful. So generally the, the law of nature is that the older people will die first. The father should die before the son. But here is the situation, the son dies before the father. So the queen is accusing material nature about this, that how can you do this? This is not the law of nature. This is not how it should be. You are the enemy of the living entities. You have no mercy. You take away the child while we're still living. So Prabhupada explains this is how people in the material world generally think like that. You know, we when things go wrong, we wonder how this could happen to me. So Prabhupada says, sometimes he accuses the Supreme Personality of Godhead of being crooked because some people are happy and some are not. The yeah, material world is like that. Some people are happy and some are not. Not everybody's happy. So what is the cause? 
Prabhupada said at the end of the purport there, 54, he said, actually, it is not the creation, it is not the creation, but the conditioned soul who is inexperienced. It's not the creator, but it's the conditioned soul who is inexperienced. He does not know how the subtle laws of fruitive activity work. And without knowledge of these laws of nature, he ignorantly, he ignorant, ignorantly criticizes the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So this is material nature, like that. We cannot understand. We are the ones who are in ignorance. But the Queen was accusing material nature you can do like this. So, sometimes people, they're thinking, karma is supreme. That we heard, in the, yesterday we were talking for a little while about karma mimamsa, that karma is supreme. But, there's something greater than karma, and that is the, the desire of the Supreme Lord the will of the Supreme Lord. He is supreme over karma. And Prabhupada here, in 55, Prabhupada quotes Brahma Samhita, that karma is not eternal, karma can be changed. Right? Karmani nirdahatu kintu chabakti bhajam. Right? One who is taken to Krishna consciousness is not affected by the results of karma. In this verse, karma has been stressed on the basis of karma mimamsa philosophy, which says that one must act according, one must act according to his karma, and that a supreme controller must give the result of karma. The subtle laws of karma, which are controlled by the supreme, cannot be understood by ordinary conditioned souls. The subtle laws of karma cannot be understood by the conditioned souls. So who can understand? The devotee can understand. We have to take to devotional service, then only you can be happy. So Krishna is actually the controller. So Queen Krita Duti is offering her, she's talking like a mad woman, the loss of her son. And she's telling the child, just look at your father. We are helpless without a son. We still, we shall have to suffer the distress. We'll have to go into the hellish regions. You are our only hope. She said, that I request you not to go any further with the merc merciless yama. <laughs> and in the purport, Prabhupada said, unless one has a son to offer oblations to the pitas or forefathers, one must suffer in Yamaraji's kingdom. So Queen, King Chitraketu was very much aggrieved, thinking that because his son was going away with Yamaraj, he would, he himself would again suffer. The subtle laws exist for the karmis. If one becomes a devotee, he has no more obligation to the laws of karma. So that is a fact. The devotees are not under the laws of karma. These materialists, they're all under the laws of karma. But if we have surrendered to Krishna, then we're not, we don't have to worry. So Queen Chitraketa, uh, Queen Krita Duty continues talking to her child. <coughs> so King Chitraketu was crying loudly. Both the king and the queen were lamenting. Everyone was crying in the palace. 
And it was at this time that Angira Muni came there with Narada Rishi. So the next chapter, we will hear the instructions given by Angira and Narada to Chitra Kiki. All right, are there any questions on this chapter? Anyone? Not a very philosophical chapter. Anything? Uh, Maharaj, uh, am I correct? Chitragat was a devotee or uh, he was merely clean with the knowledge of devotion to Krishna? Who? Chitragatu was a devotee or uh, he was ordinarily a king? Yes, he, well, he was a devotee to, and I, you know, he was pious. He, you can't really say he was a devotee, he wasn't actually engaged in devotional service, but he was a pious king. And he was a follower of the Vedic culture. But he's going to get instruction from Narada and Angira. And actually, in his previous life, he had some, he was a devotee. That's how he was able to become king. Because he was, you know, he was what, such a pious soul, great soul, had a lot of good qualities. But he was uh, given all this opulence, he was given so much facility for sense enjoyment. He wasn't attached to sense gratification, he just wanted a son. To, he thought his duty as a king is to have a son. That was all. So it wasn't that he was a materialist, but he was given a lot of material opulence because of his piety. But we can't really say that he was a devotee. But he becomes a devotee. Somehow, you see, because of his piety, he attracts the attention of Angira. And now Angira has come with Narada, and they're going to instruct him. And we will hear their instructions to him to help bring Chitraketu out of his lamentation and he can go on to perfect his life. Right, he's going to, he's going from king, he's going to become king of the Vijadharas and next. And then after being king of the Vijadharas, then he's cursed by Parvati, then he becomes Vritasura. And then after being killed by Vritasura, after killed by Indra, then Vritasura goes back to Godhead. So he had to finish off some karma, <laughs> some things in the material world in order to fully qualify himself to go back to Godhead. But we, we're seeing the importance of getting association, attracting the attention of saintly people. Because he was a king, because he was opulent, because he had so much, uh, he was king of the world. So certainly he got the attention of great sages and they've come to instruct him. It was by Angira's mercy he was able to get a son. And sometimes you, you get, you, you're attached to these things, you have to have these things, and there's no way to get over it. So sometimes you have to have it. And then once you get it and you suffer, and then you realize how difficult and how miserable it is and how much trouble it is, then you give up the desire after experiencing 
you know, sometimes people think, oh, it would be so nice to be rich, it would be so nice to be famous. We don't know all the troubles which are there. You have money, people always trying to steal it from you. <laughs> and you, you have money, you can't keep it, you will lose it. So, sometimes we have to learn the hardships of material life in order to understand it. We talk about the, sc the school of hard knocks. Once you get knocked on the head a few times, then you understand, wow, this is something, this is painful. <laughs> you, 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 you learn from your mistakes. So Chitraketu is learning from his mistake that he wanted that son, but the son brought him so many troubles. He's so heartbroken, he's so lamenting, it was so painful to lose. Once you get something you value and then you lose it, then it's very painful. So Narada and Angira have come and they're going to give him transcendental knowledge and bring him out of his lamentation and help him to go on. Actually, he's a great devotee of Lord Sankarshan, and he's going to go on. To, he, eventually, he will go back to Godhead to be with Lord Sankarshan. But sometimes these things are forgotten. You make some progress in devotion. The progress is never lost, but sometimes it's stopped. It just suspended for some time. Just like Chitraketu was already a great devotee previously, and somehow it became, and he, he got so attached to having a son, and you know, the idea of being the king, and you have to have a son. But then, with the help of Narada and Angira, he could come back again to the proper consciousness and understand. That is not the goal of life. The goal of life is self-realization. Okay. I guess by this. All right. So we'll see you next week. We'll go on with the Chitra Ketu next week. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai. Gorbhakta Vrinda, Ki Jai.